Hey everybody, it's Michael Fisher with PocketNow.com, here to bring you a quick comparison of two photo editing applications for Apple's iPad, Adobe's Photoshop Touch and Apple's own iPhoto for iPad. I'll do a quick overview of each one and let you know which one I would buy if I had to choose just one. It's Pocket Now. Now everyone, it's usually at this point where I say something like, I've been using these applications for years and I know what I'm talking about. But really? This is weird considering I'm a tech editor. I have not used any advanced photo editing applications. I've really used basic stuff like Earth and View and I even build stuff in Preview on iOS. So this was a first time experience for me on any platform, let alone just a tablet. So I'm gonna make plenty of mistakes and so forth. But if you're a first time user of this software as well, this comparison will be perfect for you. So let's dive in. So let's go ahead and start with iPhoto. We're going to be just doing some edits on a pretty scenic photo I took with the iPad's own camera in New York State, in the United States. You notice iPhoto is run with these icons that run along the bottom of the display. Uh, they have no labels to them, unless you call up the help screen, which we'll discuss later. So you kind of just have to feel your way through if you're running it for the first time and you don't run the help screen, which most people do. It's like reading the manual. Not a lot of people do it. So you can kind of tap around and discover what the app has to offer in that way. You're not going to hurt too many things. And you can always undo, which we'll talk about again. Firstly, you can change the orientation using a pretty helpful little dial on the bottom of the screen there. If you're not used to any kind of photo editing applications, you can use some sliders down at the bottom there that uh, interact with each other to control brightness, contrast. It takes a little getting used to, but uh, you get the hang of it eventually once you figure out exactly how that interface paradigm works. Yet more unlabeled controls along the bottom of the display appear if you pull up the color palette. These are just things like flesh tone and green and blue levels in the photo. Not exactly self-explanatory, but you get the hang of that pretty quickly. Now, tapping the brushes icon brings up an array of, you guessed it, paint brushes, which let you do things like saturate, desaturate, lighten, darken, etc. Look, I just unintentionally created a burned-through area on the photo, but you can probably do better than I. The final button on the left there is a bunch of pre-built effects that you can use to apply to the photo. Poor man's filters. Getting a little bit more comfortable, we cozy up to the rest of the application here, or at least try to, but we're not doing too well with the control interface. So, there's a handy little question mark up in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. You go ahead and tap that, and you get a fairly standard how-to menu, which includes some nice things like screenshots and labels and things of that sort. If you're looking for inline help while you're using the app, you can tap another button up top, and that gives you labels for all the buttons, which would be great if they were there to begin with, but what are you going to do? In the end, we have a fairly oversaturated, contrasty, blown-out photo that looks nothing like real life, but which I could definitely improve on if I spent more time with it. Let's see how Photoshop is different. First thing you'll notice is that Photoshop launches in landscape as opposed to portrait mode, your mileage may vary, but personally, I prefer this. It's a lot easier to work on photos in landscape mode as I tend to take more landscape photos. If you take a lot of vertically oriented photos, that might be different for you. Or if you just prefer working in portrait, that might be different. And the next thing you notice is that you're given the option to begin a tutorial or begin a project. Now, as I mentioned before, many people seem averse to tutorials and manuals and help screens and all that, and I am no exception. I went ahead and created a project. And I bumbled around for about five minutes and created a masterpiece of ridiculous nonsense, which was fun, but it yielded unimpressive results. So I went back a step and swallowed my pride and began the tutorial. And what I found was unexpectedly delightful. Adobe has really put a lot of effort into making a tutorial that is easy to use. For each individual effect that it wants to teach you, steps will appear in sequence on the bottom bar. You can advance or go back using buttons on the right. It's a very self-explanatory system. Occasionally, tips will appear via a pop-up dialog that manages not to be intrusive because they're usually relevant and useful tips, and they usually address a question that you were just about to ask aloud to yourself. Also, handy callouts pop up in smaller windows to show you where to tap and what to do. 
Now, tutorials exist for applying a lot of different effects to photos, and they're all pretty uniformly helpful and fairly easy. I was surprised at how quickly I could apply effects to certain photos. Now, more advanced uses, like carving out this woman from this photo and putting her onto a separate background, proved to be a little bit more daunting, partially because of the difficulty in using the iPad instead of a mouse and pointer or a Wacom tablet or some such, and also because of my beginner's ineptitude. Fortunately, there's always an undo button available, just like in iPhoto. When I got tired of being inept at carving out the woman from the background, I decided to change the color of this sky with another tutorial, which is something I would have done before in preview by changing the color balance of the entire photo, but with layers, and with fading, you can change just the color of the sky. This is just one of many things you can do, until eventually you end up with a masterpiece like this. You too can be a real artist someday, if you try hard. I'm just joking, of course it's junk. But, just like my overexposed photo before wasn't iPhoto's fault, this isn't Adobe's fault. It's just me being a beginner, playing around, and I'll get better, I promise. More importantly, I want to get better, because using this application is a lot of fun. So what do they have in common? They're both apps that offer a lot more functionality to help you get a lot more from your photos, but they also each have a pretty steep learning curve if you're a first-time user. A Photoshop Touch might be a little more complex, but its tutorial features are amazing and really helped me feel comfortable with the software after only about a half hour. Plus, it's a more powerful application, letting you work with layers, something not many other apps give you the power to do. Finally, once you get used to Photoshop's user interface, you then have a solid foundation for Photoshop on the desktop, in case you ever decide to upgrade to desktop class photo editing. Between the two, the price difference is notable. Photoshop is $9.99. It's double the cost of iPhoto at $4.99. But look, either way, you're spending at least $5 on an app. So if it were me, I'd spring for the extra fiver and get a much more fully featured app for my money in Photoshop. With that said, if you can get both, do so. They're each convenient, fun, and useful in their own way in different circumstances. We hope you enjoyed this quick overview of iPhoto for iPad and Adobe's Photoshop Touch. If you have a comment, something to contribute, if you're an advanced user or a beginner user, if you saw something that needs correction or something that you just liked or didn't like, drop us a comment. Thanks for watching. Michael Fisher with Pocket Now. We'll see you next week.